Dr. Jeremy Weiss here, founder of InspiredInsider.com, where I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders like the founders of P90X, Baby Einstein, Atari, many more, and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. This is part of the e-commerce mastery series where top sellers and experts teach you what really works to boost your e-commerce business. Our sponsor today is Rise25.com, where entrepreneurs of six, seven, and eight-figure businesses come together live and in person every few months to solve their biggest business challenges and leave with lifelong friendships. Check out Rise25.com. It's run by myself and co-founder John Corcoran. It's application only because we keep it to a very, very small group. Today, I'm excited with Peter Awad, who founded Import Auto Performance, which he has grown into a seven-figure business, IAP Direct, IAP Direct has been selling car parts online for over 15 years. Peter looks young, but yeah, 15 years. He also is the co-founder of Mission Meats that sells grass-fed beef sticks and bars, and they even donate a portion of the profits to charity. If that wasn't enough, he runs the Slow Hustle podcast, which we're going to talk about, and he showcases the massive roller coaster that is entrepreneurship, and he manages to do all this with four kids. Peter, thanks for joining me. Hey, man. Thanks for having me, Jeremy. So your wife is a saint is what I get from that intro. No doubt, bro. No doubt, man. She's, she's you know, four kids. She's home. She's homeschooling. I mean, homeschooling she's got... Homeschooling, too. Yes, sir. She's got the tough job. Wow. So I want to start off. I mean, there's so much I want to talk about, but I have to talk about a day in the life of Peter because <laughs> I don't know how you manage all this. Um, I know you do chunking, you have different techniques. Talk about, I don't know if you want to talk about today. Walk me through today or walk me through yesterday. What's, yeah, what's the day look like? Yeah, so today, uh, I was, like I was just telling you off the air, man, I'm super overbooked um, because I just like talking to people. I mean, yeah. like I told my wife years ago, if I could talk to people for a living, that's what I would do because I just like making friends. I mean, it sounds weird, but I like making friends. So today, uh, you know, my, my, my morning was all my batch tasks. Yeah. You talk about chunking, right? So yeah. uh, my calendar is, uh, is, is always, I always have set for the day what my big rocks are, like my yeah. most important tasks, and that's what I'm going to tackle. So yeah. I get up in the morning. What's that um, today? Got, what are the big rocks today? Um, let's open it up and see, man. I can tell you right now. Once, once I get them done, and it's done. All right, so for, so for me, it was um, very boring, right? So it was managing what our future POs were going to be for the for the automotive business. Yeah. Um, we do blanket POs so we can get you know, better pricing. It's the boring pricing. stuff that moves the needle. So go it's on. It's the yeah. boring <laughs> stuff, man. It's boring yeah. stuff, man. Steady plotting, right? Step yeah. by step. So um, And so for me, it's like, you know, I, I get up. I have a, a very kind of um, st- stringent morning routine, yeah. if you want to hear about that. Yeah, what time do you wake up usually? Um, typically 5.40. That's typically my That's morning. Early. Today, yeah. I, I actually got up at 6.40 because I was up Slacking a little late. Off. I'm slacking no, I'm off, <laughs> um, totally slacking. And so, um, so I get up. I've got like this morning breakfast. I actually just started blogging about it a little bit today. Um, Which is what? It's um, it's a disgusting smoothie, man. And so it's a smoothie. And Sounds if you want to know, what's, I'll, t- I'll tell you right now what's in it. So there's actually there's there's a a, a, a non dairy milk or a, a milk alternative like a cashew milk or something like that. Yeah. Um, and broccoli, uh, uh, about a third of a pound. Which if you if you know is what that it means, actually fresh or frozen? So frozen broccoli, frozen. fresh spinach, right? And usually it's actually fresh power greens when I was out. So a third a pound of that, which is a lot of greens, um, carrots and uh, kelp powder, MCT oil, and some some frozen berries, and it's just disgusting. And then nothing I drink it. about that sounds sweet. There's nothing sweet in it. Well, the the berries is a little bit sweet, right? So yeah. it gives a little bit of sweetness, uh, makes it a little bit more palatable. Um, it's fairly nasty, uh, but for me, it's like rocket fuel, man, and that's what I'm blog- blogging so about. So do you like, make that for you, for just you or for your kids and wife, or who eats that? Well, typically, they're not up yet, and so yeah. what I'll do is I'll make a double batch, and I'll put a cup of it in the fridge, and my wife wakes up, and it's there for her. Okay. So it's a little bit of service I can do for her before I leave the house, and right. so I do that. i got a morning routine. I follow, I've been following Miracle Morning Routine um, since the beginning of the year, and that's been amazing um, where there's visualizations and affirmations and all kinds of good stuff. I do a little bit of Bible reading, um, which you'll be surprised to hear when you hear me curse so much. I'll, I'll keep it clean on this show. <laughs> and, uh, and, then, and then I jump into my big rocks, man. And usually I do all of that at the coffee shop. Um, I just feel like, you know, I've been tra- I traveled for a year and I got used to the noise, the background noise and yeah. the ambiance of coffee shops. And so it's been hard to beat it out of me since we got back home here in the Midwest. And so I do all that at the, at the coffee shop. 
And then I get into the office and I start burning through inbox, man. And so I'll burn through my, my main inbox. What time I, is that? How long do you stay at the coffee shop for? Y- it depends on if I'm, like what kind of flow I'm in. Because sometimes I'll be I'll do some uh, my big rock for the day will be some some um, writing, whether that's blogging or journaling. And so mm. usually by nine to ten, I'm in the office. Um, yeah. And then um, I burn through my inboxes. So I got my main inbox and then um, you know the e-commerce inboxes. Um, and then like, so that's what I did today. And then my afternoons, all meetings. And so I got a monthly mastermind with uh, some homies of mine. Um, I had a couple phone calls, um, for the meat company. I'm trying to figure out, you know, the directions that we're going to take. And, yeah. and, and so I pull on, um, I try to pull on friendships as much as I can, you know, so I've got friend, a lot of friends in the food space, a lot of them with all their, their products and all the whole foods and Kroger's and targets and all that. So I pull on them. I'm like, Hey, I'm the noob, um, in the food space. How can you help me? We're thinking about getting a broker. We're thinking about doing this. And so yeah. that's the call I was on right before yours. Um, I got a call like that right after this, and then I've got um, another podcast interview before I go home around 5.30. So what was interesting about what's going on with Mission Meats? Um, well, uh, you know, it's, it's interesting to me is how fast it's grown, yeah. um, mostly through our relationships, mostly through industry knowledge from, you know, the other e-commerce company. And, and, and actually, you know, uh, a lot of the growth has stemmed from uh, relationships that I built in uh, a severely failed past tech startup. And so, really? Um, what yeah, do you mean so by that? Well, it's fun because, you know, when you're in the heat of, you know, working on a company for years and years and years, and I won't yeah. say what the company was, but I it worked on it for years and years and years, and it just never caught traction. And yeah. then I end up, you know, I end up, you know, leaving, leaving the organization, um, which is a whole other story. And you feel like, man, I just wasted all this time. Like I could have made more money, a lot more money working at Subway, right, for all the hours I put in and the, the actual financial return. Right. But there's all these other hard or difficult to measure byproducts of like yeah. I, I made a lot of relationships, man. You know, we, we covered a lot of the country in our, in our travels and lunch and learns that we're holding and all these different things. And so a lot of those connections are now feeding into some of the successes here, right? So the people that I met right. on that journey that I can now pull on on, on this journey uh, of yeah. this new e-commerce uh, uh, business. And so, um, you know, so the business is exciting in the fact that it's growing a lot faster than we expected. Um, it's also exciting because uh, we, from the beginning, we, det- we wanted it to be a mission-related company, right? And yeah. I'll tell you what that means in a minute. So it's called Mission Meets for a reason um, because we want to partner with organizations that are doing just really amazing things, right? Yeah. And so uh, we got two uh, partners uh, in, you know, in the States, two internationally, and they're working on diverse, you know, diverse number of things. So the ones in the States are, you know, we got food pantry for the homeless and the, yeah. you know. Is that the people. one, I think on your side, it's Orange County or Feeding the yep. Hungry? Yep. South Orange County. Yep. Yeah. And so we, we provided. Why did you choose some, that one? I mean, there's so many out there. Yeah, so that one was so during our travels we were most in the southwest in California, right? And um, when we were in um, South Orange County uh, church, I was going to, I was like, you know, we're looking for another partner. And a friend of ours there was like, hey, you know, there's a bunch of organizations. He sent me a bunch. He's like, and so I reached out to a few. This one, we just, you know, we kind of hit it off with them. Um, the timing was really right. They were building a snack food program for the summer. And they're like, hey, you know, we, we would love to have this product. We, we have a hard time getting a hold of, you know, proteins yeah. for, the, for um, these snack food boxes. And so that, that worked out, you know, really, really well. Um, the, the one that's in, uh, Minneapolis that we're actually, you know, the family and I, kids and all, we're doing an in-service there next Tuesday in Minneapolis. Um, they take women and children in, rehabilitate, really rehabilitate them, give them some life skills that they can then use, um, to, to re-enter, um, the workforce, so to speak. Yeah. And so we've got that one. That one was through, a uh, um, a, uh, family friend. Um, our family member actually is an aunt of my wife's. And so she's been on their board for, for very, very many years. And so we've got them. Um, uh, my co-founder worked in Haiti for a while. And we've, so we've got an organization there that deals with deforestation and then a really, really close family friend of ours, um, was dealing with an, or working with an organization called educate out in Uganda. And they take kids in high school and college and put them through an entrepreneurship program. Oh, cool. In the end, yeah. they've got amazing stories yeah. of entrepreneurship. I saw that so, on your site, and I'm like, all of them see completely random. You know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, seem, seemingly unrelated, right? And so, but they're all like, connected through friends or family or both, yeah. um, which is really cool. And, and you know, and the you know specifically the educate one is really exciting to me because I mean I love business, and so to be able to take somebody and teach them to fish, if that's the yeah. right phrase. Um, is so cool to me, man, because you're teaching them a skill that then they can take outside of that organization, even when they're not 
connected to it anymore and still do some amazing things for them and their family and their yeah. friends and their communities. Peter, talk about the decision to to do that, to actually give back. You know, because as you know, um, something like that is very capital intensive. And mm-hmm. you're making, obviously, a very conscious decision to take a portion of that and not pour it into business, but pour it into nonprofit. Yeah. So uh, I'm glad you asked this, Jeremy. Um, so I'll tell you where it stems from. Uh, I'll take you back and just, you know, t- paint a picture for you. So yeah. um, I'm originally from Florida. Uh, our home base is in Iowa now. It's Are you pretty- in Iowa right now? I'm in Iowa right okay. now. Okay. I'm in Decor, Iowa right now, and and it's freaking cold here in the winter. Like it's very cold. And I'm from Florida, and I'm Egyptian. I'm a brown guy. I mean, it's like it is cold here, man. <laughs> and so like every February we we take we I would like we gotta get out of here. So we go visit my family down in Florida. I got friends in the Cayman Islands. Like we just I'm like I gotta get out of here. I don't care if I gotta sleep on a couch. We gotta go right. And so um, 2015 we um, decided it was gonna be California. And so there was no friends or family there at the, at the time. Yeah. And I'm reading this book called Bold by Peter Diamandis. Yeah, it's, a great book, uh, so yeah. a, it's a great book, man. And there is a portion in there, I can't remember what chapter it was, that was talking about having this mission or having um, uh, a greater purpose within your business, right? And so I started thinking, I'm like, okay, we just started Slow Hustle. Um, and that was, you know, to me, it was like, okay, that's mission based for sure, right? Like, I'm, we're helping people to live out a greater life, right? That's not just hustle your face off all day long. And so I'm like, okay, so I was feeling the newness of that in contrast to the automotive business, which is just built out of something that I was enjoying at the time that, you know, maybe not enjoying as much anymore. And I, so I seen the contrast there and I'm like, okay, what can I do with my e-commerce knowledge that then could also have a mission, a mission, you know, purpose to it. So right. that's kind of how that was born. But for me, it's really, really simple to give a portion of the proceeds because it's like, man, I personally tithe. Um, I've been doing that for, for, I don't know, seven years right. now. And so to give up a portion of, uh, of my income, not a big deal, right? Because for me, I feel like that's kind of a core component. Yeah, just ingrained uh, in what you do. Yes, ingrained yeah. in what I do. So I'm like, why can't we do that with our business? I think it's pretty, pretty simple, mm-hmm. right? And, and for me, it's also such a, much, it's such a better way to do business, man. To feel like it's, you're not just churning widgets. You're not like sell, making something for five and selling it for ten. Like you're actually making a real difference. Not just saying it. You're actually doing it. So when I get an email like I like I've gotten the last couple of weeks where it's like these are like real people, kids, eating our product, right? Or real real people seeing their pictures and seeing the effect that our small contribution made to their life. That's real impact, man. And yeah. so. And to me, it's like, okay, that's going to carry me through when we have a bad day and we have some issues yeah. with product or issues with distribution, sure. issues with you know, logistics. That'll carry you through that. Yeah. So, Peter, let's say someone's listening to this. And they're like, that sounds amazing. I want to do that. How do you decide on how much to give and what to give? Yeah. Um, so Without, to- obviously, killing the business. <laughs> yeah, I, uh, you know, my, my co-founder and I joke sometimes, we're like, well, if we go out of business, we're not helping anybody, so let's be careful here, right? Right, yeah, uh, exactly. Yeah, um, you know, so, we, we, you know, I I personally give 10% of my income out, you know, and I don't even think about it, honestly. Like, it's been something that we just budget in, and I give it out, and that's just how it is. And, you know, it's biblical for us, yeah. for you, it could be something else. Um, and so I think it's a, it's a very personal decision. Um, you want it to be substantial enough to where you're making an impact, but not so much so that it puts you out of business like you're saying. Um, and so, I mean, you can pick a percentage. And the other thing, you know, a mentor of mine says, he's like, you can always start small and ramp up, right? Um, but I think that if you picked a percentage um, that's meaningful and you set it from the beginning, then it's a lot easier to stick to. It's a lot harder to ramp up, right? Right. But, but if you just stick to that percentage and right. you have it auto, like any, you live up to your means. So if you're giving away 10%, percent, you, right. you don't even see that 10% anymore. You don't even right? see it. It's the same principle to savings, same principle to retirement, all that stuff. Right. So, before. so um, and for us, like anytime money hits our account, that's a positive. A percentage gets kicked over to, to another savings account. Like it just goes away. So we don't. It is you don't. Not only do you not feel yeah. it. It's super easy to give the money away because it's not in your yeah. main account anymore. So, so did we, you decide on the same percentage for the business as you do personally? Yeah, yeah. So that's the percentage. That's the percentage that we set, right? So, um, and then that's where we're at right now. But we actually we were just talking the other day about ramping that up um, even further. So we'll see kind of where that goes. Um, and the thing is for me too, man, is and this is not true for everybody out there. Is like I'm a pretty simple guy, like. We have, an, we have a uh, phrase in our house that it's experiences over stuff. Like, 
most things I really don't give a crap about. I still love cars, by the way, but I don't drive anything nice because I is <laughs> right. But um, for, and that's a whole other story. But um, outside of that, like I don't really need much. I just like experiences. So as long as I can fund my experiences and I can yeah. feed my kids really good food and we can yeah. have really amazing like ex- life experiences, I don't yeah. really need yeah. much else. So in the entrepreneurship world, business world, what is the most memorable experience? What comes to mind <laughs> for you? <laughs> Um, you know what, man, I'm, I'll take it way back. Uh, to, yeah. and then this is probably how you, people usually roll, but, um, I always have a set thing I'm going to talk about and then I always throw it out the window within the first five seconds. So, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's fine. Man. So for me, um, I got to tell you, man, it was when the light bulb came on for me. So uh, I'll give you just quick, quick, quick rundown. My yeah. parents are immigrants from both from Egypt, came here, you know, with, 500 bucks and the clothes on their back, really? that whole bit. In Florida, yeah, they, yeah. they went to Florida, straight to Florida? They went to, they went to Cleveland first, which Cleveland. is where I still have family, yep, and then uh, moved to Florida when I was about three years old and, and grew up in, in kind of the center of the state there in Orlando. But yeah. So I grew up in the grocery store environment, man, and I, 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 loved, I loved the hustle. I what did your loved, dad do? Um, before the grocery store? No, no. Like when you were in Florida, because I, I have a note here that I want to ask about, because part of the slow hustle too, I find it, it comes from, I think, seeing your dad going through that roller coaster. I remember you saying he'd come home and one day it'd be high and one day it'd be low. So I want to uh-huh. hear about, yeah, some of those. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so he, I mean, he ran the grocery store. I mean, they were doing, they're wearing all the hats of that. Um, my mom worked in the morning, my dad worked at night, the high five uh, as they changed shift, that whole thing, right? Really? And wow. so... Um, and so they didn't see each other much working. They worked seven days a week for first six to seven years and six days a week for the remaining years, which was like 18 or 19 years. So they worked wow. a lot. But I loved the store, man. I loved everything about it. Like I loved, you know, making sandwiches and mopping the floor and selling beer when I shouldn't have been and stocking coolers. I just did all that. And I loved it, man, getting paid five dollars an hour from the age of seven to 13 until I finally asked for minimum wage. And my dad <laughs> said yes. And I thought, damn, I should have asked you like years ago. Um, <laughs> But, um, yeah. you know, so I, I learned to hustle in the business, um, you know, from a very early age. But my most memorable experience, to answer your question, um, was when I realized I could buy something for one price and sell it for another. And it was so easy to me, right? What so, was it? Yeah. So there were blow pops, right? Which I don't know if you guys remember that, but it's like a, it's like a lollipop with a piece of gum in the middle, right? Sure. And um, my dad had gone to the wholesale house and he came back with some. And um, I said, Dad, I want to buy one of those boxes off you. It was three bucks, I remember. And um, I took it to the store, took it to school. And it was in a Gap bag. I don't know if you guys remember. I don't know if Gap still does this. I, they probably don't. But Gaps used to have the bags used to have have like a pull string or it's like a drawstring bag mm-hmm. is where, when sure, you buy yeah. your clothes. So I have these this bag full of um, blow pops. I'm standing in the hallway. My first class was like band or something like that. And I'm standing in the in the band hallway and I sell them all. And they're a quarter a piece. Wow. So I made fifteen fifteen bucks. So I netted twelve dollars on this three dollar box. And I remember thinking, oh, my God, I'm rich, and I need more of these damn blow pops, right? So I go home. I'm like, Dad, I need five more boxes. And so and then, so it was me. I was, like, selling a box a day, like, first 15 minutes of school. I'm, making, I'm netting $12. I felt like I was just totally rich, man. Um, but I just loved – and this is probably why I like e-commerce, man, because I, it, it's like if, if I can find a market – like, I know there's a market that needs this, and mm-hmm. I can source the product for cheaper, yeah. and I can just make that transaction to facilitate that, to me – is so exciting. So I would say that's probably my most memorable experience. So talk about what's a big lesson you learned from your dad growing up? Uh, there's so much there, man. I think, you know, um, it, it w- definitely wasn't one lesson. It's, it's a broader lesson, and it's like the, v- the value of a dollar. And I think about this with my kids all the time. It's like I want them to know what things cost and what it takes to put a dollar in your bank account, mm-hmm. right? And a dollar could be 100 or 1,000, whatever, however mm-hmm. you want to look at it. But um, because I saw how much these guys worked. Like I saw it. It was in front of me. It was very yeah. visible. Yeah. And so most kids don't get to see their parents working, right? They see their parents leave for work and they see them come back for work. And mm-hmm. then they go to the ATM. They put this plastic thing in and cash pours out. They don't understand it, right? right. It's like a buddy right. of mine who said that most kids think bananas grow at Walmart. You know, it's like <laughs> they, don't, they, have, they have no connection, Right. <laughs> And right. so, uh, yeah, and so true. for me, I mean, he, what, what him and my mom taught me was like this connection to work and yeah. what it really looked like yeah. and what it took. And theirs was in a very extreme case cause they were running a business and 
right. and learning as they went along um, in a very difficult remi- uh, environment that's very work intensive. But I'd say that's my number one lesson, man. And, How do you and build that in for your kids? Because obviously you, you know, your parents at a grocery store, you can go in there. What do yeah. you do? Yeah. So, I mean, the kids come to the office, not super frequently, but, you know, regularly where they'll see me working and they'll see what I'm doing. Um, but um, right now we um, we're, we're trying we have this new take and this is totally an experiment with us. But um, we're having them they gain. They, they get three bucks every Monday. Right. It's called it Monday, Monday. And it's not allowance. It is their um, their It's their proceeds as their contribution to the team. And so it's how they contribute on a day-to-day basis, not task-oriented. It's just like, hey, you chip in where you need to, and this is what you're going to get uh, as a byproduct of that. Right. And they get to save it, and we've got these little what they call moon jars where they put a dollar into saving, spending, and giving. Yeah, yeah. And so they're getting this whole – they have this whole mission component and giving component. They bring their, they're like the yeah. only kids that have money to bring um, at church when the, when the plate gets tossed or, or passed around. Yeah. Uh, but the other thing is, is that I have them involved in purchasing. Right. And so my daughter, I tell the story all the time. My daughter likes to eat out as, as do I. And so she'll say, hey, dad, I want to eat out. I'm like, yeah, we can do that. It's 50 bucks. And she'll say, huh? And it's $50. So they're like, if we want to just go to like a burger joint, we got a big family. It's going to be about 50 bucks. Right. And she just has this look on her face. And I say, you still want to go? And she says, no. I don't. <laughs> And so that that's a very like stupid example, but it's like right. she has a she There's has a value a seen to money there. She has a value. She yeah. understands, okay, I only get three bucks a week. Fifty bucks, dang, that's a lot of money, you know. She's not gonna have to pay for it, but she understands like, okay, she's got a connection to money. She understands that when we go to eat, like we actually have to pay for that. I think most kids they don't understand, like, wait, this is a service, I have to pay this person and getting coffee, I gotta pay. So they, they I have them involved in that so that they understand there's transactions happening. And their and their presence of those. Yeah. So I mean, I have to ask about import auto performance and what the landscape was like 15 years ago. But I still want to follow up with the Mission Meats because I'm really curious. How did this even begin? Yeah. So I had a friend of mine that was in uh, the, the cattle business that had a stick company. Um, and um, he was, you know, kind of transitioning out. And um, and I had, you know, some 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 knowledge of kind of like the inner workings and stuff like that. And uh, to me, it was a perfect way to enter into a market where we could a have repeat business, which we don't in import auto. We we deal with very niche products. Right. So I'm like, I really like to get in the, into the repeat yeah, business. Yeah, that makes market. sense. Um, and then I also really wanted to get into food because originally the idea was that we would partner with a food program, right? We're a food company. We want to partner with a food program. Yeah. And um, the funny story there is that my the person that my friend of mine that connected me with Educate, her name is Jody, and uh, she's been in the, in the mission field forever, hundreds of trips to Africa. And I told her my my idea. I want to have a food company. We're gonna partner with food programs. And she said, I hate it. I said, Okay, <laughs> tell me more. I don't know what you mean. You hate what? This sounds great. She's like, food programs suck. And so if you're, if you're listening and you're in a food program, I'm sorry. And she's like, because they, they come into a village and the, and the village just becomes really, really, um, uh, uh, they become attached to that food program and, and that's it. Like that's, they just, they just get used not to it. It's not self-sustaining type of thing. It's not self-sustaining. She's like, you need to have a program that comes in and raises people up and, and teaches them some skills mm. they can take with them outside of that. Mm. And that's yeah. how I got into Educate. So Hence that's the Empowering how got, Uganda. Yes, yeah. empowering Uganda, exactly, man. And they're now in Rwanda, but um, and so um, so that's how that's how I got into the food business. So what's been some of the challenges? Because this is not easy, you know. It's <laughs> so like, on one hand, obviously it's consumable, it's good, and the auto parts, but they probably have a mold, they stamp it, it's the same every time, it's you know replicatable food. There's a little, you know, you're dealing with. Variability. Um, yeah, variability and the cow stock and whatever, whatever it is. So what, what are some of the challenges you've seen? Oh, it's, it's amazing, man. So, I, you know, in the car parts business, I never was in manufacturing. I didn't go that far because mm-hmm. I was worried about liabilities and stuff like that. And so um, just, just manufacturing your own product in general is very interesting. Developing your own brand, dealing with USDA is very interesting. I love I'm the word interesting. About, this means um, <laughs> it's a good talk story. About, Talk about variability, man. I mean, you're like, yeah. you send something to USDA, it gets kicked back in two days or it gets kicked back in six weeks and there's like no consistency there, you know? 
Um, but they're doing their job. They're doing what they can. Um, and um, I mean, there's 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 challenges all over the place. I mean, you're dealing with a product that's shelf stable, but it has an expiration date. Um, you have variability in the raw material that you get in, right? So it's all good product, but there's going to be some variables there that you have to deal with. Yeah. Um, you know, cold storage and logi- logistics when it's when it's it's still in its raw form. Yeah. Uh, there's been a huge learning curve, man. And I tell you, what's helped with that is partnering with a co-founder that has, he has the industry, industry experience, and, yeah. right? So my co-founder has, you know, very little online experience, but tons of offline food distribution experience. And so yeah. I was like, it's a perfect, um, perfect it was, uh, partnership. It was a, per, it's a perfect partnership, you know, so we have very complementary skill sets. Um, and so for someone that's listening, that's like, Hey, I want to crack into a new market or I want to take my e-commerce skills and apply them to an industry I've never been in. Um, I highly recommend a co-founder now, <laughs> saying that it's very difficult to find a co-founder that yeah. has complementary skill set and um, it's like marriage you know it is very much like marriage yeah. I would say in some senses it's worse than marriage or more difficult than marriage <laughs> right um, and so I you know I caution you to be, be careful and really you want to it's the same way you want to hire right you don't want to hire necessarily on skill set it's more so on character and culture, uh, cultural fit. And so, um, I think that is where I've gone wrong in the past. It's like when you're hiring for skill set, it's very easy and it's predefined and you can measure that, right? Um, it's tough to measure, uh, character and culture, but I think that when you hire or co-found based on that, you've got a much higher likelihood of success. So you talk about logistics. Is that you think the most difficult part of the business? Um, man, um, logistics, I don't want to stress you out too much right now. No, 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 you're not, man. It's tough to stress me out. Uh, (laughs) I I think logistics is difficult. Um, I wouldn't say it's the most difficult. I think variability in production when you come into food is difficult. Um, because, um, like you said, I mean, products, you got, you know, products that are getting stamped out when it's an automotive is very much different when you're making a food product. And so, um, I would say, uh, manufacturing consistency is most difficult when it comes to the food industry because you have variability in, uh, you know, room air temp and humidity and cook time and, uh, vacuum sealing, right? I mean, there's all these different components that could, one of them, just one of them can throw a whole batch off, right? Um, and so, um, and we've dealt with some of that and we've, we've gone through that and, um, but there's just things that you can measure, things you can correct, things you can't. And so I would say the manufacturing is actually most difficult. Um, logistics may be second, but second, second worst. Peter, so what's the most popular product for Mission Meats? Um, so, so Mission Meats only has three SKUs right now. Yep. We've got a t- tasty original blazing pepper and then we've got a beef bar we just rolled out. Mm-hmm. Um, the original was the first um, and it's probably still the you most You have an original popular. and like a spicy, right? Like stick? Original spi- yeah. That's right. That's right. So the, so the original meat stick is the most popular, um, mm-hmm. although the beef bars that we rolled out about 60 days ago are just taken off like crazy because um, it's one of the only beef bars on the market that doesn't have any sugar um, mm-hmm. or sweeteners. And so the paleo and Whole30 community are loving that, man. Um, and so the beef bars could, and they could surpass. We'll see. We'll see how it goes. How do you decide to roll out those flavors? Because you could obviously, you know, choose a million different variations. What was yeah. the, the thought process behind that? Well, we're trying to keep it super, uh, keep it simple, stupid, right? So yeah. that old acronym. Um, it's very enticing to roll out tons of flavors. Yeah. Um, and uh, tons of like really sophisticated recipes. We're kind of trying to keep it simple so we can get all of our processes down. Yeah. Um, get a better get a better handle on the landscape on our customer base. Um, we're gonna get creative on recipes real soon here, um, but first we want to get like we want to have our core business down, get our distribution down, yeah. all that good yeah. stuff first. So you call out the new product, the bar. You're the e-commerce master. What do you do to get it out there? <laughs> Um, you know, really the simplest thing is marketing to your current customer base, right? right. Like you've got to, and so you've got to raise awareness on, um, uh, with, with this new, with the, the current client base that you've got a new product coming out. And so that's what we've been doing with them. So we've been, um, retargeting the, uh, current customer base to let them know there's beef bars coming out. Mm-hmm. We offer, we'll offer discounts to the current customer base, yeah. which is interesting to me because, you know, most companies, whether you're in food or outside of food, 
um, it's it's all about new customer acquisition, and you're offering coupons and discounts to new people. Right? Right. So you think about that super annoying ad for a cable company or a phone company. It's like discounts, new customers only. Well, what the hell? What about the guy that's been supporting your business right. forever? Right. And so for us, we um we will offer discounts to return you know to to current customers only. Right. right. So it'll be a coupon, and we'll only advertise that or send that out to customers that have purchased from us before, which makes them feel appreciated. But also, you already know they're interested in that type of product because they've purchased it before, right? So um, marketing to your current customer base with that new product and giving them a discount, I think, is really interesting. What about if you don't have customers yet? Like when you first launched the first original stick, yeah. what'd you do? <laughs> hustle like crazy, man. Slow hustle. Uh, yeah. Slow hustling like crazy. So, um, you know, we're on Amazon. We're on our website. Um, and so we were just like pounding the pavement, yeah. dude. Like. When you met me, even now, if you like check my backpack, which I carry my laptop in, there are, that thing's full of meat sticks, dude. So when when it's I like was the out, blow pops, except for the, decades later, right? You show up at exactly, like a gym. I have these beef fries. <laughs> <laughs> right, the hustle doesn't change, right? It's just a new product <laughs> and a new avenue. But but um, but no, man. When you would run into me, I'd always have sticks on me, right? And so if you were a buddy of mine, I'd be giving you samples to eat them. Um, everybody that I saw knew that we were peddling meat sticks, that we started this company. And so I was right. telling everybody, totally shameless, right? Um, and the thing is, is your friends want to support you. Yeah. Like they really want to support you. So I'd have friends eating them, tweeting about them, Facebooking, just like everything, right? We didn't have a mm -hmm. Facebook page. We barely even have one now. Um, and so I, we were doing that. You know, we got on Amazon. We're running Facebook ads. I mean, we're just really, man, I mean, nothing totally innovative. It's just like just trying to appear yeah. to be everywhere. Yeah. Um, so that we can get that name out, and and then like I said earlier, we are pulling on our uh, you know our friends that are in the industry yeah. for advice and and yeah. and getting distribution as quickly as yeah. we could. Who's given the most helpful advice for Mission Meats? Um, there's there are two folks involved, um, or you know two folks from the beginning. Uh, one gentleman's name is Sean, who he's run multiple you know. Uh, seven, eight, and nine-figure uh, e-commerce companies who mm -hmm. helped, gave me a ton of advice on what to do and what yeah. not to do in the space. Um, what were two the, thing, What was one thing to do and what was something not to do? <laughs> All right, now you're going you're gonna to test my memory here. Um, so these are conversations from like 15 months ago. Um, you know, uh, what, What's like a big mistake you definitely avoided by talking to either Sean or someone else? That, right, you, that, that maybe seemed counterintuitive that you would have done. I would have rolled out a lot more flavors. You would have. Um, there's no. I would have rolled out a lot more flavors, and probably early on. Um, there's. I mean, to me, you you see anything, you pick anything on the shelf. There are you know seven, eight, nine, ten flavors. Um, yeah. Some brands feel like they just pop up out of nowhere, and they've got a load of flavors. And yeah. um, I think I would have rolled out with a lot more flavors. Um, I would have rolled out with a lot more SKUs, right? So a lot more you know quantity um, options. And um, that would have strapped us, man, yeah. because the thing is, the way everything works, it's like, okay, well, if you've got that many flavors, well, then you need that many boxes and you need that many different labels and labels have, if you want a good quantity discount, you need 100,000 of each. Um, and so, I mean, before yeah. you know it. It's a lot it, of just, beef sticks. It's a lot of beef sticks. It's a lot of inventory. If You know, you got buffer locations for inventory. You've got endpoint locations. And so um, even adding an additional SKU it may look like it's only going to be a you know twenty thirty thousand dollar investment, and turns out to be a lot more than that. And so, um, I mean, he definitely helped me understand the long term ramifications of of expanding the product line, um, and instead just focusing on your you know your core couple of SKUs until you get your feet you know get your kind of foothold in the market. Yeah. So that was avoided. <clears throat> what was something that? Because again, you have a lot of experience in e-commerce, so you're going to these people who also have a lot of experience, but what was something that you learned from them that you did that helped boost the sales that you didn't know? Mm. Something for boosting sales. Yeah. Um, that's a really interesting one. I don't know that it was learned from either one of them, yeah. but um, it's it's for me, that's what's been surprising is constantly testing other um with with the same SKU, uh, testing different product offerings, and I'll tell you what I mean by that yeah. is like, for us, we started out with a couple of different quantity options that seemed to be 
any i mean those are the those are the quantities i would buy yeah. right so it's got to be the only thing that anybody else would, like, yeah. th- those are to me they're most intuitive yeah. so and what then, do you start with what what can people buy like if they yeah, go on so amazon so we started out with just two quantity offerings 12 packs and 24 packs got right yeah. 20 and 40 point 20 and 40 dollar price point respectively yeah and um, those seem to be it, right? I'm like, man, if it was me and it's a stick I never bought, I mean, it'd be hard for me to even spend 20 bucks on something I didn't know was good. Right, right, right. right. Um, and and then watching analytics and seeing like people were buying multiples of those quantities. Really? And realize, wow. yeah, and realize, and realizing like, wow, we probably should offer largest, larger package sizes, even though we think it's ridiculous, right? Yeah. Um, and so doing that and realizing that there were some sales to be made there. Well, mm-hmm. without necessarily adding more inventory, right? Um, and so um, being able to do that and um, and pick up some of these larger sales that maybe people yeah. wouldn't have done. Now, there's another thing that um, I just listened to recently. It's a book called Predictably Irrational. Love that book. And yeah, the book is amazing, right? And so one of the one of the things he talked about was the decoy, which I thought was really interesting. Mm. And so for somebody listening to me, this was like a huge e-commerce lesson. And so I'll give you his example. He talked mm-hmm. about um, uh, online and print magazine. I can't remember the name. Maybe you remember. They had three price points on the website. They had $59 or $55 for internet only. Yes. They had $125 for print only. And they had $125, I didn't misspeak, $125 for print and internet package. And so he talked about how uh, when he ran these through these, these, these test subjects, the majority of them picked a $125 print and internet only package. Nobody print, picked print only, and a few people picked the internet only. So he thought, well, surely since nobody picked print only, I could remove that and run through another set of test subjects, and the, the results should be the same, right, if people were thinking rationally. Right. But when he ran it through, the majority of people picked internet only. And so his whole thing was the print only option was a decoy to make the print and internet option, the one they wanted you to pick, look much more attractive and a much better quote-unquote deal. Right. And so to me, there's a lot of e-commerce That's lessons there. Where, yeah. where well, you see, like for us, it's like, well, well, let's say we were offering, in our example, which we haven't done this yet, but we're thinking about it. If you offered um, a, a 12 dollar or 12 pack and 24 pack, well, what if you offered a, a 20 pack that was about the same price as a 24 pack? Like what mm-hmm. would happen? I don't know what would happen, yeah. um, but it could be interesting, right? And maybe it doesn't apply to meat sticks, but it's to me, oh. the moral of it is you got to constantly be thinking and constantly learning about different ways that you can move the needle. So will you release like a hundred pack? Like from what you said, people are buying multiples of these we packs. Have, so what we do have you have? We have, we have 144 packs. So we've got, oh, yeah. right now we've got 12, 24, 48, uh, 72, 96, 144. So how big of a pain is it to, to do the different quantities? As far as packaging goes, um, well, it just depends on how you set it up, right? Like, so you could have a legitimate 144 pack, or when somebody orders a 144 pack, you can manually enter I see, I see. an order for multiples of 24, stuff like that. So you don't necessarily have to take on more inventory. There's more manual labor involved of like yeah, yeah. You know, manipulating the order. But those are simple ways to me to test the market. Yeah. Um, to see what the market wants for quantities. And then yeah. if they do want, if we do sell a lot of 144 packs, well, then we start stocking legitimate 144 packs on yeah. the shelf. Right? But you got to test first. And so right. I'm like, to me, I'm always testing. To yeah. me, I'm always running some, an MVP. So if you're familiar with Lean Startup methodology and terminology, I'm running the MVP, which is like, what's the quickest and, and most expen- least expensive way to test an idea to validate it, right? You do that, and then once you validate it, then right. you, um, you make some changes. Yeah. You know, Peter, one of your strengths you could tell is looking at the data, looking and testing. Um, what are some of the software and tools you use to run the business? Because you mentioned you throw out retargeting, you throw out Facebook ads. What are some things that you actually are looking at on a daily basis? And I know in previous times you've mentioned you use you know, things like followup.cc, which you love. What else are the uh, softwares or tools that you love? Yeah, yeah. I'd love I to love like that one too, th- by the way, yeah. I'd I'd love to dive dive deep on follow up CC because I think to me um, and I've written about this before and talked about it like follow up is the secret weapon like it is it um, because most people just don't do it they don't take the time I, I'm not sure why they don't do it and maybe it's pure laziness but 
Um, you know, so I mean, so the site right now um, is on it's on built on Shopify. We're using a recurring uh, orders app called uh, by Bold Apps um, that allows you to do recurring orders and offer that. Um, we have some. I have a, a really awesome programmer um, that I pull on. He's built some custom integrations with Amazon and a few other things for us. Um, you know the the, the follow up thing though, man. I, I'd love to dive deep if I may. Yeah. Um, because uh, you know, follow up that CC is like hundred dollars a year if you get a pro account or whatever the hell they it's call it. It's a no brainer. Yeah. It's an absolute no brainer. I use it twenty to thirty times a day, literally. Yeah. Um, you know when people have read your emails. I bet you. I bet you use it more than that. Yeah. I probably use it more than that. Yeah. I mean, I because because the, the the thing is is that. Very rarely does somebody who you're reaching out to that's busy and worth their weight is going to get back to you right away, right? And so I oh, mine, mine set the default at one week, and so I almost have that box clicked almost every single time. And if I don't hear from you in a week, I'm going to follow up with you. And I'm going to look like Johnny on the spot, but I'm not really going to remember anything unless I use that thing, right? It's like my brain. And I'm going to continue to follow up until I hear back. And I don't know how many interviews I've landed because of it. I don't know how many awesome meetings I've gotten to have and business that we've done because I've continued to follow up and be that guy that's remembered. Versus the, the the person that um, that's that pinged you and you ignored them and then they never got back to you, right? Mm-hmm. So I mean, it's 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 to me, I'm like, if, if you're not using it, if you're listening and you're not using followup.cc, you are missing the boat. Yeah, completely agree, hundred percent. So followup.cc, Shopify, you said buy bold is what you use. Yeah, for. so it's, re- it's a recurring orders um, app. The company's called Bold Apps. Give me one second, and I'll, go- I'll Google it for you here. Yeah, bold- okay, so they're, they are called um, Bold Commerce, okay. and they've got, a, they've got a number of apps. The one that I'm using right now by them is, um, is a recurring orders app. Mm-hmm. And then retargeting. What do you? Are there certain companies you recommend or use? So I uh, so r- well right now because um, you know we used to have to use uh, what the heck were they called? They started with a P. Um, like perfect audience or something. You, you used to have to use perfect audience, but you you don't. I mean, you don't need them anymore, right? And so uh, you use a Facebook pixel, mm-hmm. and you can re- you can retarget directly, right? Yeah. Um, and so um, and so we've done that. Um, we've definitely used custom audiences, which to me has been amazing. Um, so if you're not familiar with that and you're listening, you, you, you know, you take your, your, your audience, uh, data, whether it's phone numbers or emails or both upload them, and then you can, you can target those buyers, which is the most tremendous because they've already voted with their wallets. I mean, and they don't have to be buyers, right? So I'll correct that. They could be somebody that's given you their email address or information, haven't purchased anything. Buyers is probably better, but yeah. Buyers is better. Um, another thing we haven't done yet is to create um, a um, look-alike audience use from our, our custom audience. I haven't done that yet. Um, but um, that has been tremendous, is being able to target that custom audience and to let them know we've got new product or to offer them a coupon. Um, and um, it's, just, it's, it's been killer, man. It's, it's fun when you, when you discover stuff like that and follow up with CC. You're like, how did I live life without it? And right. Why the hell isn't everybody doing this? What about for, I mean, you have a lot of inventory. What about for inventory management? I mean, I don't know how uh, you keep track of hundreds of millions of sticks of beef. <laughs> I think we're actually up in the millions now, which is, yeah. I mean, it's unfathomable, right? So it's like, I, it, anyways, it's crazy, man. Um, so, I mean, we, we use QuickBooks for our accounting software. Um, I honestly don't deal with the inventory stuff. Mm-hmm. Um, my, my co-founder deals with logistics, and that's one of his things is he deals with the yeah. inventory. Um, and so um, I'm not sure what they're doing for inventory management, as yeah. bad a question as that is. Um, I get to see the reports, but he handles all of that stuff. So I'm not sure how they're, how they're yeah. moving inventory, tracking it there. So top of mind for you with Mission Means, is it getting into groceries? Or what's... So, so a lot of the conversations I'm having right now, like the one I had before and the one I'm going to have after, is yeah. going to be our best strategy for growth within retail. Um, yeah. as, as weird as it sounds, it's super appealing to get into a bunch of stores and to be able to say I'm in all the Whole Foods and I'm in, yeah. um, and I'm in all these retailers and they yeah. move a lot of volume, but they make your life hell. And so, right. uh, so I mean, like I just got off this conversation, Jeremy, right before I got on the call, yeah. and my 
my conclusion was yeah. maybe I don't want to get into yeah. retail. I have a few people for you to talk to also, so we'll have to, okay. we'll have to chat. Yeah, <laughs> that'd be awesome. Um, for sure. Maybe the, maybe they'll help me look a little bit more positive at it. But the, no, I, I, they may agree with that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they just you know what the thing is is that yeah. I'm a, I'm a founder. I'm type A. Um, I yeah. like controlling things, and it sure sounds like to me that retailers control you. Um, and the more I hear about it, the more yeah. I feel like, man, I don't want to be jumping through hoops for people. Um, I'd rather just work with yeah. the consumer, I think. So we'll, we'll see how that goes. Yeah. One of the guys I interviewed, um, the company Miracle Noodle, um, yeah. is really big on, uh, retail distribution. I mean, I'm in Chicago. He, I don't where he's located. Um, but I mean, they're in grocery stores here and like all over the place. Um, maybe in Iowa too. So, okay. We'll see if he's open. You guys can chat. Um, <laughs> cool. Appreciate that. You know, that's all is concerning. I have so much. Um, I want to talk about import auto. I want to talk, talk about, um, you know, the slow hustle. And I even want to talk about the Iowa Startup Accelerator 10 month. We're not going to have time for all that because we have about 10 minutes. But um, import auto performance. What's the landscape like for e-commerce 15 years ago? <laughs> Um, naked man, uh, a barren wasteland. It was, it was like the wild west. Yeah. Um, how did you get into selling car parts? Um, I mean, obviously you were an enthusiast. You probably, uh, were yeah. really into cars, but that's different from actually starting an online e-commerce. Yeah. Store. Uh, company started by complete accident. Uh, I was in college. I was completely broke. Um, I ran into a guy at a show. He had, um, he was a, a, um, a dealer's rep. I didn't even know what that meant at the time, and I started getting product from him at a discount for myself. He said, hey, you look like an upstanding kid. Maybe you want to start selling these products to your friends. I'll get you a better deal. I thought, hmm, there's this thing called eBay. Let me see what's up. You know, let me see what's on there. There was yeah. nothing in that category, and so we listed the first products ever in that category as far as I'm wow, concerned. that's crazy. Um, I didn't have any money, and so I would sell product before I owned it, and then I'd make a sale, and I'd race over to his house and like, dude, I I need this product. Um, I'd call him, he'd order it. Next day he'd have it. I'd go pick it up. This is in between classes, uh, studying engineering at the time. Um, And uh, I would package shipments in the parking lot of the mailboxes, et cetera, which is now the UPS store. And um, I'd have packing peanuts and boxes and tape and labels all pre-printed in my trunk. And so that's how the business started, man. And, um, you know, it's changed a lot since then, you know, and you've got like a manual drop ship model, sort of, right? What's that? Uh, Like a manual drop ship, like they'd order it and then you'd pick it up and pack it up. Pick it up. The best way to do it. Yeah, and yeah, you didn't have to own any inventory. Um, you got paid up front. I mean, it's really uh, incredible, you know. And now, of course, we've got our own warehouse and uh, a lot of our own product that we own there. And um, it's just it's a it's a different it's a different scenario. Um, it grew uh, organically and um, just you know through hustle. I mean, I worked in that company um, through college, you know, from around midnight to you know four o'clock in the morning because that's the time that I had. Because I also worked a twenty-hour-a-week internship and went to school, you know, right. fifty, sixty hours a week depending on the workload. And so, um, you know, that that business is interesting, man. I mean, it's it's um, it turned into something I never thought it would. I was just trying to make some extra cash. You know, I had I didn't have any money, um, and so it's it was really fun, man. I got to cut my teeth on that company. So after college. Did you just go straight into import auto performance and keep oh, running yeah. that? Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So did yeah, you wonder it, why you even went to college at some point? Like, I could have um, just... I, I wondered why I went to college while I was in college, right? So it's like, um, I went into engineering because I liked cars, and you don't you don't get to see a car in college unless you take some extra classes, which I did. But, um, you know, during that, during my time there and do, going through a couple of uh, engineering internships, I realized that it just wasn't for me, you know? Um, and, uh, during that time starting the company. So yeah, I graduated and just kept doing that. And my parents thought I was just the biggest idiot on the face of the planet. They're like, wait a minute, dude, you went to school for engineering and you're going to play on the internet instead. I said, yeah, I'm going to play on the internet instead. Um, and so, you know, I've, and I've never regretted it. Of course, there's been years where I'm like, geez, this would be a lot easier to get a full-time job and not have to deal with this crap, you know? Um, but in the end, I like the flexibility. I like the ability to do, you know, to do amazing things and to grow products from scratch and to yeah. watch ideas materialize. Um, 
that to me is just like that's where the fun happens. So Peter, what are some of the big milestones for import auto performance? Um, that's a really good question, man. I, I, I don't know that there's one milestone or another. To me, that company has been a testament to steady plotting, right? It's just like been grinding and adding products and looking for opportunities to add um, different segments to the company, um, watching what used to be your bread and butter just like dematerialize in front of your eyes and then having to Why? figure out. Um, well, that's a really good question, man. There's a number of different things. I'll tell you what the what the one of the biggest ones has been in the last five years, and that's been Amazon, man. I mean, mm. they go into industries or you know or verticals, no matter what they are, and if there's a b- large amount of volume there, they have all the data, they private label product, um, and they can pull the rug out from under you, wow. you know. And it's and scary. I've seen that, I've seen it happen over and over and over again, and so that's why I think. For the e-commerce people out there, um, owning your brand is critically important. Um, and not everybody can do it, but if you can, if there's an opportunity there. If you think about it for a minute and you can own your brand, um, there's huge value there and to be able to have no competition um, in your specific product, right? Of course, there can be competitive products, but um, to own that brand is, is tremendously valuable. What was the decision to come up with your own warehouse because you know, that's also, you know, time, money. Before it was much simpler with uh, mm-hmm. just getting it and then packing it and shipping it. Yeah. What so, so to clarify, to get, yeah. well, so to clarify, we we use a three PL, right? So third party yeah. logistics provider. Um, we've been using them for uh, ten years now. So before three PLs were like a thing, before yeah. FBA and Prime was even existed. Um, and, uh, I did it because I like, I would like to scale through somebody else's people. Yeah. Um, we were dealing with inbound and outbound here, uh, at the office and it's just, it's a huge headache, you know, it's, I mean, there's small things like the printer jamming up from a day to day basis to running out of packing materials to not being there when, you know, FedEx and UPS arrive or go to pick up. There's just a lot of logistics there. And so, um, we went with a three PL so that we could scale, um, through busy season, um, and let, or allow them to scale and um, turn it up and, and wind it down without having to, you know, deal with the headaches involved. Yeah. So, Peter, what works best today for import auto? You cut your teeth on this stuff, and it's in a very competitive market. So I mm-hmm. guess if it works in that, it can work with Mission Meats or anywhere else. What's <laughs> working today for import auto performance? Yeah. It's so it's what it's what has always worked for us, and it's it's dealing with products that are tough to support. And so I'll tell you what I mean by that. It's like there are so many products in automotive that you can just put on the shelf and they sell themselves, right? And so there's just stuff that you can just like plug and play. doesn't require any customer support. Anybody can, you know, can, can do it. We typically don't deal with products like that. We typically deal with products that have like half-year applications um, that, re- that have all these different v- variations that are difficult to use and all these different things because um, the guys and the people that I like to call the ankle biters that are out there that want to just like copy everything and make a couple of bucks and move on, they're not going to pick those products up because they don't understand them. They're not yeah. going to pick them up because they, if somebody calls them on the phone, they're not going to know what to say. You know? right. um, and so I deal with There's those. There's a barrier of entry. For those there's, a huge, there's a huge barrier to entry, and, and we've also, we typically look for products that are underrepresented online, um, you know, that maybe they're, 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 they're way behind in, in their digital marketing um, spend or, or, or um, presence, and so we look for companies like that. Um, but another thing I tell you that, that's really worked well for us, and I think that has helped keep us around for such a long time, is that maybe outside of one of our uh, primary lines, I don't think it's even true for that one anymore, for for all of our lines, I know the founders of the company, or I know the president of the company. I know the people that are like at the helm running the company, and the reason that that's important is because you get to develop relations relationships with those people. They're gonna be I'm gonna I'm gonna be at the top of the list when of people they call when they've got a deal, or they've got some product they want to liquidate, or they're looking for advice. Like I just had the mm-hmm. the president of a company contact me and ask me for advice. Um, on their pricing strategy and ask me for advice on their warehousing strategy, like these different things, right? And I love it because I, I want to be in it with them, right? I want to be there yeah. as, a, as a real partner and not just like a line item on their revenue. Like I want to be there. I want them to think of me. Right. I, want them, I want us to be friends. And we right. talked about that at the beginning, right? Um, and so I think it's critically important to be in business like that. 
Um, so, I mean, out of anything that I just said, I would say that's probably um, that's probably our number one strategy, man. And our number one strength is like being able to to be friends with these people yeah. and um, and develop those real relationships with uh, with the vendors that we're dealing with. Yeah. Peter, this has been great. I have one last question for you. I know we have a minute or so. Um, first, let's point people towards a couple of your sites so they can check them out. Yeah. Where, where should yeah. they check out online? Yeah. So, I mean, I'm pushing Mission Meats heavy right now. So, yeah. missionmeats.co, right? So, we're going to try to get .com from that meat guy in Canada that's got it right now. Um, so, if you know the meat guy in Canada, tell him I really want that domain name. Um, and um, But I don't have any money to pay him. I'm just kidding. Um, and, and so, missionmeats.co. And then Slow yeah. Hustle, man. Slowhustle.com. Uh, putting a ton of energy in that right now. Um, the movement's really, really killer uh, for us. We've got a band we just rolled out. It's a leather band. I don't know if you've seen mm. it, Jeremy. Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah, I don't know if I, maybe I showed it to you at Podcast Movement, but um, you know, it's got slow on one side and hustle on the other. And the way that people are using it, the way that I use it, is that I've got it on hustle mode all day long, but before I get home, I just switch it over to slow. So slow is on top. It's my visual cue that mm, I need to slow down. I got down. you, yeah. Yeah, and so that's been really killer, people sharing on social on how they're using it and how it's affected their trip with their family and how it's affecting their downtime um, because it's there and it's a reminder. So, um, uh, yeah, and if people want to get plugged in on Slow Hustle, we made it super simple. You just text Slow Hustle, all one word, to 44222, and they can opt in to our weekly email where um, I just share like what's on my mind, um, gadgets that I'm using both for productivity and for hustle, mm -hmm. but that also help with your with your slowness. So it's fun. So do you have another? Do you? I was going to ask about a low point and a high point, and I also want you to distinguish between fast and slow hustle because I think it's really important to distinguish that. Do you yeah. have another minute or two, or do you have to? I know you sure, have, sure, you have sure. back to back meetings here. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah no. I can I can do it, man. Because um, it's kind of like you. I, lo I love what you talk about. I love what you're about um, with the slow hustle and everything else. Because, um, And that's why we connected at uh, Podcast Movement. I guess we were meant to meet because really it's about the reality of things, not just the glorified what you see on um, you know, someone's top line revenue or something like that, but really what it takes, some of the behind the scenes, some of the tough moments, the challenges. Uh, that people have to go through to get to that point, and like you, like you were saying, so I want to know about a a low moment and how you push through, and then a proud moment, you know, because there's those peaks and valleys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd say a low moment for me um, was around the real estate, you know, meltdown. You know, I was at, I was in Florida. We had just recently moved to Iowa. I had a bunch of property down there, and I mm. lost a ton of money. I mean, like a ridiculous amount of money. Um, being in the automotive space, I mean, it's a, to me, it's it's all luxury, right? Like nobody needs to spend the I money see. that they're spending on this product. So, company tanks. Um, I've lost all like a, probably my entire life savings in real estate. I'm I'm like I'm broken. You know, and in that, I learned so much about where I was placing my value. Right, mm -hmm. I, was, I was placing my value in all of these material and external things. I was placing my value in my in my success monetarily, when really none of that stuff even mattered. Right, and so I get, I had a ton of personal growth then. At the same time as when we started tithing, actually, um, when we were completely broke. Wow. And so to me, That's I'm like, so interesting. To, I'm like, I need to be I need to be a, a good steward with my money now, hmm. right? Because then when I when I when I recover it'll be a lot easier, right? So the same thing I talked about in the beginning of like setting the mission in the beginning. We're like, dude, we are completely broken now. My tithe is going to be minuscule and obscure and ridiculous now, but I'm going to do it anyways. Yeah. And that's when I started doing that, man. And, and st a lot of things turned around since then, right? And so I would say that's a low moment. Um, what made you do that, though? That, that's completely counterintuitive, right? Because <laughs> you, you have nothing, right? And then you decide to give. Yeah, well, the thing is, is like if you look at the data, the more people make, the less they give, percentage-wise, right? Really? Okay, yeah. Uh, yeah, because it just it feels more difficult. The money becomes really substantial, right? And so, like to me, it was like if I can set the discipline in place now, then when the money becomes really substantial, I don't give a crap, right? You know, because I've already had that discipline. I've re I'm already used to it. I'm going to share in the bounty. Like if I'm making more money, I'm giving more money, and so. Um, you know, that, man, I mean, that is, it's biblical. It's, you know, it's, it's um, through some of the advisors that I was talking about and mentors I was talking, talking yeah. to, um, I should say, then um, all aided in 
to um, beginning that discipline, right? Yeah. So I would call that a low moment and a high moment at the same time, as weird as that sounds, yeah. um, because there's so much growth that happened then. Um, and to keep that in mind when you're having a really hard time is where a lot of that growth happens is when you are stretched to the limits. Um, and so I, I, I would call that, you know, both the low and the high. You asked me another question, though, yeah. I forgot. I was saying the proudest business achievement so far for you. Yeah, yeah. Um, the proudest business achievement. It's funny, man. I'm going to keep it really... We're uh, going to oh, turn the slow to the hustle right now, so I yeah, want the hustle yeah. side of things. Yeah, yeah, and, th- and that's what you asked about, too, about slow hustle. Yeah. I'll talk about that in a second. So, um, you know you know what's proudest for me, man? This is really going to be really super cheesy. Um, I got a wife. I have four kids, right? It's like a big family, yeah. and... I look when I look when I sit and I look around I'm like the the ideas that cooked in my brain materialize this right they materialize I mean my wife and I materialize as human beings right with God's help we we have a home we have food we have a we have a very comfortable life and it's like the ideas something that was in my head right, that became yeah. that became ones and zeros programmatically and it turned into this like it just materialized right. Creating that to something me, out of nothing type of thing. It's yeah. to me it's yeah. complete magic. Yeah, yeah. That's entrepreneurship, right? Yes, it is. So fast hustle. You make the distinction slow hustle, right? Yeah. So yeah. talk about fast hustle versus slow hustle. Yeah, to me fast hustle is just straight hustle, right? And so I had a friend of mine um, that we were talking about the slow hustle band, and he's laughing. He's like, just print me one. He's like, give me a custom one that just says hustle on both sides. Because that, that, that <laughs> fast hustle is just hustle, right? Like that's just right. it's hustle your face off, hustle all the time, hustle, 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 right? And, and right. here's the thing. There's so many reasons why you don't want to do that, okay? You can do that for a, for a period of time, and then you're going to burn out. You're going to do that for a period of time, and it could be 10, could be 20 years. And you're going to look back, and you're going to be like, look at all of my – you know, physical achievements, look at all my monetary achievements, look at all the things that I've done and look at all the, the people I left in my wake, yeah. right? You're going to, you're going to, you're not going to see your kids grow up. Right. You're going to become, you know, I was talking to somebody or, or yesterday or Tuesday about this. You, this is when people say I grew apart from my spouse. No, you don't grow apart. That doesn't happen, right? You are very intentional about growing apart. It's because you didn't put any time into it. So like that, like that, those are the people that you leave in your wake, right? That's the fast hustle. It just hustle your face off. All day long, every day, right? To me, the slow hustle is being very intentional about what's most important in your life, about how you spend your time, about keeping your priorities straight. But at the same time, it's making space, right? right? You need boredom, right, to have creativity and to have, you know, to to elevate the way that you think. You need space to, 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 to have good ideas, right? So I always make this example. I always give this example. Your good ideas happen when? When you're grinding behind the computer? No. Never. Yeah, when you're relaxing or in the shower or on vacation. When you're in the yeah. shower, yeah. when you're on vacation, when you're on the toilet. I mean, that's where the ideas happen. Why? Because you're slow. You have space. And so yeah. slow hustle is about living a life that's worth living, keeping your priorities straight. I'll give you another example of how you do that in a, in a second. But, man, I mean, with the slow hustle, I think you can be even more successful, Right? Personally, right? You can be a personal success with your friends and your family and yourself, right? But then you can be a, 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 a larger business success because you've given your space. You've given yourself space to think creatively, right? To rise above your problems and to think more creative and have some creative, you know, better solutions. Out of the box, if you want to call it that, I hate that phrase, but out of the box solutions, right? Okay, so here's the other thing. This is, this is one very, very weird, morbid way that I have slowness in my life and keep my priorities straight. Yeah. There is a, and I, I, I tell this on every interview, there, there's, there is a, uh, a practice called negative visualization. Um, it's uh, kind of a stoic philosophy, right? And it's a way for you, and I might have shared this with you when I talked to you, Jeremy. Um, it's a way for you to visualize very bad things happen in your life. So for me, an example would be one of my kids get cancer get hit by a car, right. I get cancer, my wife gets cancer, she dies suddenly. Right. I think all those things, not to bring myself down, but to give myself perspective and to think, right. you know what, if I start my day that way, no matter what problem I have today, yeah. no, ma- no matter what issue I have, I will know it doesn't mean jack. Right. It is not important. Does it suck? Sure. Is it the end of the world? No, it's not. 
Because if one of those bad things happened to me, right. I would say, you know what? I would rather have ten times the problems I had today and not ha- and have this, this, this cancer or this issue go away, yeah. right? And if that's the case, anything that I encounter today doesn't mean squat. Yeah. It really gives perspective. Yeah. So throw your positive visualization out the window. Go with negative visualization. <laughs> <laughs> Not every day. You don't have to do it every day. But, but just in the morning. You know. Just in the morning. No, but, I like but, that. It really does give yeah. perspective on what's important. Peter, I can go on for another couple hours. I know you have a bunch of meetings. <laughs> Everyone should check out missionmeets.co.co, slowhustle.com. Peter, it's been great. Thank you so much. Dude, it's been awesome. Man. Thanks, dude.